Hispanic Caucus Institute. Welcome to CHCI's 2023 Capitol Hill Briefing Series. This series is the culmination of CHCI's premier nine-month postgraduate fellowship program, which offers exceptional Latinos from throughout the country unparalleled hands-on experience working in public policy here in Washington, D.C. This unique fellowship program seeks to enhance participants' leadership abilities, strengthen their professional skills, and increase the presence of Latinos in public policy areas, this year specifically in the areas of health, technology, housing, education, and the environment. CHCI is thrilled to offer our postgraduate fellows the opportunity to share their perspectives on policy issues they're passionate about and convene leaders in this work for an informative conversation. We'd like to thank our postgraduate fellowship program sponsors whose support for the program is invaluable. The sponsors include Meta, the PepsiCo Foundation, America's Health Insurance Plans, the Walton Family Foundation, Bristol Myers Squibb, Microsoft, DaVita, Wells Fargo, and CVS Health. During and after today's session, you can keep this important conversation going and broaden the number of people engaged by using the hashtag CHCI Fellows on social media. We hope that you will. To learn more about our postgraduate fellowship program, as well as our other leadership programs and special events, please visit chci.org. And we encourage you to reach out to our fellows directly via LinkedIn to learn more about their policy topic and also please help them connect with job opportunities for when their program concludes in May. Thanks so much for joining us. And now, enjoy the discussion. Third District, and I serve as the Democratic Leader for the House Committee on Education and the Workforce. I want to thank the Congressional Hispanic Caucus Institute for inviting me to be part of today's briefing. And I'm pleased to introduce one of our committee's fellows, Natalia Guzman, who will be moderating today's panel. Growing up in a disadvantaged and food insecure community, she experienced firsthand the hardships people face to obtain nourishing food. She also experienced the benefits of federal food assistance programs, including child nutrition programs, as her parents worked hard to raise their three daughters. Experiencing these adversities sparked her commitment to improving food and nutrition security in our community and across the nation. Because of her background and expertise, Natalia was a perfect fit for our committee's child nutrition priorities. She was particularly critical in our work to advance the Healthy Meals, Healthy Kids Act out of committee last Congress. This bill delivers on my goal to ensure that every child has the healthy meals needed to learn and grow. Natalia, thank you again for all of the work that you have done and for your dedication in improving children's access to nutritious foods. Now it is my pleasure to welcome our moderator, Natalia Guzman. Thank you so much, Congressman Scott, for your opening remarks and all your work as ranking member of the House Committee on Education and the Workforce, especially with ensuring food and nutrition security and equity for all children living in this country. Good afternoon. My name is Natalia Guzman, and I am the 2022-2023 CACI PepsiCo Nutritional Health Graduate Fellow. I'm so excited to be with you all today and accompanied by a panel of experts on a topic I am passionate about. As someone who is a recent registered dietitian nutritionist, my goal is to be a healthcare provider and advocate for weight inclusive care and awareness and treatment for eating disorders and disordered eating. With that said, I would like to welcome you all to the 2023 Congressional Hispanic Caucus Institute's policy briefing on eating disorders and disordered eating. As mentioned, today we'll be discussing eating disorders and disordered eating broadly and within the Latina community. In the United States, at least 28.8 million Americans will have an eating disorder in their lifetime, but less than 20% ever receive treatment. Eating disorders can affect anyone regardless of age, gender, race, religion, ethnicity, sexual orientation, body, shape, and weight. 
Untreated eating disorders can result in decreased heart function, cause gastrointestinal problems, brain damage, and even death. Eating disorder and disorder eating research among and including marginalized communities and identities are limited. The lack of diverse research hinders the ability to generalize study results and prevents some populations from experiencing the benefits of research innovations. Depending on the eating disorder, Latinas and Hispanics have equivalent or more rates of eating disorders than non-Hispanic white people. However, Latinas are significantly less likely than white people to receive a recommendation or referral for further eating disorder care. And only 41% of Latinas are accurately diagnosed with an eating disorder. Due to primary research, assessments, screening tools, and treatment, focused on and developed and validated for cisgender white women and girls, Latinas are at risk of experiencing under-identification of symptoms, especially when a primary healthcare provider is solely focused on weight loss. According to the CDC, about 44.8% of Latina adults live with obesity and is the second highest group compared to other ethnic and racial non-dominant groups. Since obesity is associated as a risk factor for chronic diseases, weight loss is often recommended, which can also bring about an eating disorder or disorder eating. In addition, binge eating disorder is high among this population and is associated with obesity and type two diabetes, along with other medical conditions. Therefore, focusing solely on the weight of a person can actually lead to worse health outcomes and contribute to weight stigma. Underutilization of services is also a problem. Factors that contribute to underutilization includes lack of knowledge, fear of stigma, a belief that one should be able to help oneself, lack of healthcare coverage, and lack of affordable and accessible services. As of 2021, 19% of Hispanics are uninsured, the second highest uninsured group. 33% are insured through Medicaid or other public insurance, and 48% are insured by their employer or other private insurance. This creates a barrier to receiving appropriate medical care in general, with a bigger barrier for those who are documented and undocumented immigrants. That being said, the lack of research and diagnosis recommending weight loss instead of eating disorder treatment underutilization of services, and the need for diverse providers are just a few problems that need to be addressed to better access eating disorders and disorder eating treatment. Before we introduce our panelists for this session, I would like to remind everyone to please ask your questions directly in the chat or use the Q&A feature, and please direct your question to a panelist. Also, please feel free to, the, to read the panelists' full bios on the briefing series website. Now it is time to introduce our panelists. Our first panelist is Whitney Trotter. Whitney is the owner, founder of Bluff City Health and is duly licensed as a registered dietitian, nurse, and yoga instructor. She has over 10 years of experience working as a registered dietitian serving various communities such as the HIV AIDS community, as well as working in the eating disorder field. Whitney, the audience may be wondering why I used air quotes when I said obese in my intro. As you introduce yourself, can you please provide a clinical definition of obesity and why it shouldn't be used as a tool to determine health? Welcome, Whitney. Okay, can you hear me okay? Yep. Yep, so sorry about that. Thank you so much for the wonderful introduction. Um, again, Whitney Trotter, um, dietitian, and hopefully soon to be Psych and P. So I'm so happy to be here with you today and among these amazing panelists who I am fans of and admire so much of their work. Um, and to address your question, absolutely. Um, I think it's interesting, and th these are not my quotes, so I, um, I want to do due diligence, but there is a phenomenal um, person by, their name is Fran, and I love what they say about obesity. I'm going to use it in, in quotes as well as they talk about it as a social construct. And when we think about the clinical definition, um, scientifically speaking, um, we're scientifically speaking, we're uh, speaking on increased adiposity 
because we know obesity, the roots of it um, are not only does it drive weight stigma in this country, um, but it's also influenced by the BMI. And for those that don't know, um, the BMI is the body mass index that was done in a time of eugenics around 200 years ago, and it only looked at white men and it took a height to weight ratio. And for some reason, we're still using calculation and statistics that were done 200 years ago exclusively on white men to define what health and wellness is for a significant majority of people. I'm making sure I was not muted. Thank you so much, Whitney. Um, yeah, definitely finding out during my time, um, like said, like taking the educate, taking the opportunity to educate myself further on like what's going on because it's something that we don't really touch on when we're studying dietetics. Um, but like reading these books and like how this was never supposed to be kind of like the way or like reasons like just the fact that it was not even like somebody health who created the BMI is like wild to me and we use it to this day is kind of kind of concerning, but <laughs> thank you so much. I really appreciate your remarks. Um, but I'll move forward with our next panelist. Next, we have Erin Flores. Erin is a registered dietitian, registered dietitian nutritionist and certified body trust provider with over 10 years of experience. Erin has worked with eating disorders in a variety of settings over his career and currently has a private practice where he uses intuitive eating, health at every size, and body trust as the framework to help individuals develop a more compassionate, non-judgmental approach to food and their body. Welcome, Aaron. Hi, Natalia, thanks for having me. I'm very excited to be here. And like Whitney, I, I'm uh, thrilled to be a part of this panel with such esteemed colleagues who I am also fans of. So thank you for having me. No problem, thank you so much for joining. Anything else you would want to share? Yeah. So, um, yeah, so I'm a dietitian and uh, I do a lot of work um, working with uh, with men who are experiencing eating disorders. And as someone who does this kind of work, the question I often get is, you know, so can you tell us more about what men experiencing eating disorders is like? And my first answer to that is it's varied. Uh, it's a really broad question. There are. First of all, there's no one way to be a man. And how we think about gender in this world is uh, needs to be expansive. And so thinking about who falls under this umbrella of men experiencing eating disorders is really varied. Um, we And so my hope in, in discussions like this is we get to include a lot of narratives. Uh, I do like stories. I think it's really interesting and, and a great way for us to learn to help think about all of the different ways in which, and all the different folks who could be experiencing eating disorders and how do we make space for their story? Um, and that includes trans folks, non-binary folks, regardless men uh, uh, or those who identify as male, regardless of sexual orientation, race, uh, and, uh, and, and all the other ways in which people can, uh, you know, identify in this world. So, um, yeah, I'm just going to keep going if that's okay, unless you have a question. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. No, okay, great. Um, so I think the, the thing that is really Im important for folks to think about is that um, men who are experiencing eating disorders and anyone who identifies as male who is experiencing eating disorder is likely not going to be diagnosed or screened. They're probably going to experience that eating disorder for longer and in more isolation than other folks. And what happens when that occurs is that the eating disorder actually becomes more entrenched in a lot of ways. It actually um, becomes harder to treat. So what happened, you know, we're creating, we've created this environment where folks tend to suffer in silence and not really even knowing that they are experiencing an eating disorder. You mentioned binge eating disorder. And it's, you know, um, according to statistics, it's, it's probably the most prevalent of eating disorders, more than anorexia nervosa or bulimia nervosa or other eating disorders. And yet people aren't talking about it as mm -hmm. much. And the, co the occurrence of men who experience binge eating disorder is very close to the number of uh, percentage of women who experience eating disorders also, or, or binge eating disorder, excuse me. Lastly, you mentioned obesity, right, in quotes. There's a very significant percentage, maybe like 30, 40% of people who seek weight loss treatment, 
who are experiencing eating disorders. The intervention in for that recovery is not weight loss, right? It, it's a very different way of thinking about how um, the, the, the support they're going to need uh, to heal. So the, the things that I think um, are really important to also consider is the environment in which eating disorders are almost fostered uh, amongst male identified folks. I think about like gym culture and how disordered that can be, right? Where folks are working out um, sometimes excessively, uh, they are restricting their diet uh, in very intense ways. And it's seen as, and it's praised mm -hmm. instead of seen as problematic. Um, I think about how uh, the culture of men joking with each other creates a lot of fat shaming. Uh, and it's like, you know, teasing people about their bodies uh, creates sort of this internalized shame that people struggle with. Um, I think about how masculinity is um, one of the things that sort of prevents us from actually thinking about getting treatment, right? Or sharing our feelings or saying, hey, you know, the way you joke about my body is really hurtful. I wish you wouldn't do it. Um, and so the ways in which masculinity sort of shows up in this, I think is also very uh, important. Um, so my take home, right, in, in thinking about this is that there are folks that you know who identify as male that are experiencing eating disorders. I guarantee it. Some of them don't, might not even know. Some of them might know and not be willing to share or willing to talk about it. Um, and understanding that folks are struggling, right? How do we create a more um, inclusive community in the eating disorder world where men can feel like they are allowed to talk about this, to get support? Um, they're not gonna be the only ones in treatment, which is often occurs. Um, so I think we need to just look at the male experience with a lot of curiosity. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Aaron. I really appreciate your whole remarks. Um, definitely uh, males with eating disorder, those who identify as males not talked about enough. And I really appreciate you adding the little input of like gym culture, because I feel like that's a lot, like that's what's going on in people who are my, my age, or like at least in what I see in my social media, my immediate circle. And I feel like kind of like the black sheep when I say like, Oh, like, you know, that's kind of a problem. Like, no, it's not. <laughs> like, like, yeah, yes, it is. So I really appreciate you like um, sharing that and educating the audience about like such sub, sub topic. Um, so thank you so much. And next, we'll thank you. our next panelist. Our last panelist is Dr. Malin Reyes Rodriguez. Dr. Reyes Rodriguez is a clinical professor at the Center of Excellence of Eating Disorders in the Psychiatry Department of the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. As a researcher and clinical psychologist, she has devoted her clinical research career to adapt eating disorder treatments for the Latino community in Puerto Rico and Central North Carolina. She has published numerous papers and book chapters on cultural adaptation in order to reduce health disparity and enhance treatment accessibility. Welcome, Dr. Reyes Rodriguez. Thank you, Natalia, for the invitation. Thank you for organizing this amazing uh, panel in, in a topic that is so important to talk about it. Um, um, I think that briefly I wanted to uh, mention what are the most common uh, feeding and eating disorders. Uh, we have the anorexia nervosa, we have the bulimia nervosa, the pinch eating disorders, and also the avoidant and restricting food uh, intake disorder, ARFID. Uh, the most common eating disorders in the Latino community are the Latino, uh, the pinch eating and the bulimia nervosa um, uh, disorders. Um, I think that, that something that it is important to acknowledge is that historically there has been a misconception that the eating disorder are less common in the Latino community. And that has contributed to uh, the uh, stigma 
and also with the clinician bias, uh, clinicians not necessarily assessing the eating disorder in the Latino community. So the impact also has been that the Latino community is underrepresented in research studies. So we are generalizing information without having data from our community. Uh, we are underrepresented in treatment clinical trials. For example, we have only two cultural adaptations uh, uh, um, um, research, and also we have about four clinical trials. Um, so I think that that, that is considerably like low for, for our community. Uh, why this is important? Because uh, as you said, 9% of the US population will have an eating disorder in their lifetime. Uh, so we are having over 10,000 uh, deaths per year that are related with the eating disorder. Um, and also in terms of the cost, we are talking about 64 point billion uh, to the economy of the, the US per year. The other concerning piece is that uh, the health disparity. So you can see in the graphic that compared with white, Latinos are not using services even when they are struggling with uh, bulimia and binge eating disorder. And why that is happening? Because of the treatment barriers. We have multiple barriers that are affecting our community. For example, we have the clinician bias that you mentioned. We have the lack of bilingual services. And also we have uh, the lack of health insurance. And these disorders are very expensive. And if you don't have health insurance, it's very difficult to get the services that you need. Also, we have some, uh, some barriers related with the, with the uh, system. We have the stigma. We have um, feeling not being understood. Um, and the lack of knowledge about what are the resources that we have available out there. We also have other personal barriers like motivation, like family uh, privacy, which is very cultural for us uh, and not ready to change. Also, we have identified some treatment facilitators, for example, the high emotional distress, the eating disorder severity, which is very common in the sick pattern uh, of Latino, like waiting until the symptoms are very severe. But also, I think that should be related with not having necessarily the benefit of, of having sick days and to take day off to, to seek uh, uh, treatment. Um, and also, we have uh, the support of a family or a friend as, as, a, as another way to encourage Latinos to, to seek professional help. In terms of intervention model. What we are proposing, I think that the first would be more into community-based approach. We need a community-based approach because it's, it's safe for the Latino going into a place where they feel that, that they are welcoming. And we need to tackle the system, the uh, providers, the patients, family, trying to educate about um, how to, to put out there all of the information for our community. I think that we need a national initiative uh, that can tackle the first, the prevention. I think that we need to work on prevention at school, uh, primary care setting, community. Also, we need to get more access to treatment, uh, integrating those services at the community and primary mm -hmm. care setting, because usually Latino prefer to go to primary care setting rather than specialized treatment. We need to provide education, uh, cultural sensitive education programs. And also we have to work with the weight of stigma because we know that diet restriction and body shaming are triggered for eating disorder. Uh, in the positive side, we have some uh, genetic studies like EDGY, which is a study um, led by Dr. Cynthia Bullock from UNC Chapel Hill, trying to engage more Latinos uh, into genetic study because we need to understand better uh, what are the uh, contributing factors, genetic factors, in, in order to develop treatment that are more um, uh, in tune to our community. Uh, and also we have other uh, Latin American genetic studies that also have some piece of eating disorders. Um, the take home message 
that I can give today is that first, Latino communities affected by eating disorders, that Latino community faces multiple barriers to get access to treatment, and we need a national initiative that uh, can address the social determinant like food insecurity, the lack of health insurance. Um, we need more culturally sensitive treatment and prevention programs uh, in order to uh, be more accessible. We need bilingual services um, and culturally sensitive uh, treatment. So I hope that this conversation can help us to start thinking about how um, in this case, the Congress can help with the social determinant like food insecurity, lack of health insurance. So we are hoping for a better future and we are working toward that, but we need the support of all of you. Thank you so much, Dr. Reyes Rodriguez. Everything you said was, um, was just really good. And thank you so much for educating us on um, the various like barriers and things that are going on. Like you said, um, discussing the social determinants of health um, is a way that Congress can get involved, but also policy work involving more research and providing that research. We, um, As a fellow, we get the opportunity to write a policy brief. And in that brief, I did notice like just trying to find the research itself about Latinas and experiencing eating disorders was rarely there. And then on top of that, finding out that currently there's only like 73 cents per person affected actually out allocated for research. And so it's definitely something that we need to get the ball moving in terms of you know, helping to find uh, the treatment or um, help better to treat others with um, eating disorder and disordered eating. So thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> At this point in the program, we are going to begin with the Q&A session. I do see incoming questions coming in. So I would, um, the questions that um, I'm, we ask in like the moderated portion, ask to keep it briefly, because I would really love more so the audience questions can be answered. Um, but first and foremost, as a, oh, um, let me also address the audience. Please, please feel free to engage with any of the panelists and remember to direct each of your questions to a specific speaker in the format of a question for the sake of time. So my first question for all of you, if it, um, as a dietetic student and dietitians um, who are taught the weight management for patients and clients and social media influencers are constantly teaching us uh, about the best diet for weight loss, can one of you define weight stigma and um, briefly, why is it important to each one of you to have a weight inclusive care approach in your practice? Anyone can go. <laughs> so, um, so, you know, I, um, the importance for me for having a weight inclusive practice um, is that, to be honest, I did it the other way. I became a dietitian uh, not knowing about a weight inclusive approach. I came to this work as someone who focused on a weight normative approach, right? Teaching weight loss to everyone. Mm -hmm. um, and that was a that was the approach I learned. I wasn't given a different option, but it's also the path I was living personally. Um, and through a lot of unlearning, uh, both personally, but also professionally, I realized there is, there's a kinder, more compassionate way to think about food and bodies. And so mm -hmm. for me, having and, and practicing from this approach um, is not optional. I know that it that this is uh, better and healing, and I'm, I'm going to provide people um, a different way of thinking around food. I don't think it, I don't know if it's easier, but I but I think on the other end, there's a lot more healing that people can experience rather than doing something rooted in shame. Yep, I agree. Thank you so much. Any other panelists? Um, just echoing what Aaron shared, I as well got started in kind of a weight-centric viewpoint, being a dietitian. And even when I got my first job working in an HIV AIDS clinic, it was very heavily focused on weight loss. Um, and no one at that time was thinking about um, eating disorders in the HIV population or with other infectious disease, but it was definitely there. Um, and so as the shift slowly, as my shift slowly started to change, um, 
I really realized the harm that we as providers do from solely focusing on weight loss. I mean, I cannot tell you how many illnesses are missed simply because a provider only hones in on weight loss. And like Aaron shared, there's so much shame and guilt going around that. Um, and it's interesting. I, I will tend to kind of see uh, people from di various parts of the country um, and in communities that don't have access to public transportation or vehicles and they're walking so much. Um, even when they go to the doctor, the doctor's like, lose weight, lose weight, move more, move more. I have patients that are literally walking two to three miles a day. And the doctor is still so focused on that BMI and their weight. Mm -hmm. And so we do such a disservice of simply focusing on that. And I think when you, when you make the transition, the shift to the weight inclusive, um, practice like Dr. Reyes Rodriguez was saying, also addressing social determinants of health. Mm -hmm. What does the community look like? What is your environment? What is your access to food? I know we're going to talk about insurance and barriers to treatment, but I really think all of that begins to shift as you take a, a more focus on the individual and where we shift away from this like weight obsessed culture that many providers are trained in. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Dr. Reyes, would you use anything else to add? Yeah, and, and I think that it's assuming that everybody genetically can be in the same size, and, and that is not true. And sometimes it's the expectation to be in certain way that require for that person to do a lot of restriction uh, that is, 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 is not good and would trigger the eating disorder. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, Going into it, you mentioned previously, Dr. Reyes Rodriguez, that there's only two culturally competent treatment materials that exist, um, but you didn't give your patent, like, didn't shout out yourself because you were the one who created those two culturally competent materials that exist. Um, so, how is that process and how has culturally competent treatment benefited your Latina parent, um, patients? Yeah, that work started when I I was exploring the mm -hmm. cognitive behavioral therapy for bulimia and binge eating disorder in Puerto Rico. And I was spending, even when the treatment was with, with adults, I was spending like six, seven sessions with the family. And part of our culture in Latino culture is, is the, the family. The family is like a value for us, is the connection with our family. So that um, adaptation was the one that I uh, test here in North Carolina. And one of the, the pieces that I found is that when we have a family member uh, as part of the treatment can help with the retention. And that was something that we uh, saw in our study. So compared to individual CBT, uh, the retention was about 60% versus 83 in the component having one family member uh, in the treatment. For example, having kids remind a mom, uh, you have an appointment uh, with your therapist. I am seeing progress on you. Mom, you need to go to treatment. So that kind of uh, um, motivation and support uh, was key to retain uh, my patient into treatment. And we know that for Latino community, it's, it's hard to engage into, into treatment, but also retain into treatment is very hard. So everything that we can do to retain them into treatment is, is a win. Thank you so much, Dr. Reyes Rodriguez. I would take the time to kind of like integrate my questions with the audience questions. Like again, like I feel like it's more important to answer the audience questions um, now that they're here and um, they're coming in. So Whitney, someone had asked, um, how can we educate the larger community on the impacts of obesity and how to instill better habits in our children? So this is a good question. I get asked a lot being a dietitian and nurse. And I think again, it's how does, how are we defining obesity? Are we simply defining it off the BMI? Because that's very problematic. And again, I'm, I'm aware that a lot of people don't understand the history and the problematic nature of the BMI. And so this could be uh, the first wave of that. And so I would say one, really do a lot of research on just the racist implications of utilizing the BMI and the weight stigma um, that accompanies the use of BMI. 
And I'm so glad we're talking about this policy briefing because policy needs to change, right? We we have to change the policy on why people are discriminated solely based on their BMI and weight when it comes to life insurance, when it comes to accessing insurance, when it comes to being denied, um, I mean, life-saving care. How many people are denied knee replacements, hip replacements, other things that they need to improve quality of life based on a 200-year statistic? And so I would say first, we that would be the first education that we need to do community-wise on the impact of the BMI and other problematic things. I would also say what I see um, is we've got to be able to increase the screening, assessment, and diagnosis across the board of eating disorders for those that live in higher weight individuals, those with disabilities, those are who gender diverse, racially and ethnically diverse as well because it, it is hard if we aren't getting um, the screening and assessment and diagnosis, it delays the ability to access care. Um, and when we talk about the impacts uh, to habits in our children, um, I'm a former pediatric nurse. I spent the majority of my nursing career working at a pediatric emergency room. And um, I, I think what's really missing with the impact of our children is we don't take social determinants social determinants of health seriously, right? We don't take the environment in which children are growing up and thriving seriously. And what happens is we get so focused on the child presenting with a certain weight or the growth curve. And then um, and instead of figuring out what are the barriers to affording food, what are the barriers to joyful movement for this family? Can they even go outside? I mean, again, I, I live in one of the most dangerous cities in the country. And so if you can't even go outside and get some vitamin D, how is that impacting overall health and wellness? If a grocery, if I don't have access to a car or gas, how do I get to a grocery store? How do I actually get food to my family? And so these are things that we need to be thinking about behavioral changes and impact on child and adolescents that we can address with effective policy change. Thank you so much. Wayne. Very important, especially with um, the guidelines that rolled out recently about um, recommending bariatric surgery for children. And that's a whole other thing we can discuss about. Um, but it's important for um, to educate others on like different on this topic in different ways that we can address it and um, helping educate those with children to um, help them um, to, to be uh, to, to receive the best treatment that they can and everything. Thank you so much. Um, Aaron, someone asked, uh, how can parents of boys with uh, a suspected eating disorder support them through this process? Yeah, it's a great question. I think it connects exactly to what you're sort of actually just talking about. Um, I think in a lot of ways, we need to question everything. Uh, we need to sort of be very expansive when we think about health. And we need to be expansive around thinking about what our kids are going to be experiencing around food and the body shame uh, they can they can already experience as 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 kids. Um, you know, so the first thing I think we can do as parents is create environments in our home where we can talk about food and body without guilt or shame. Right? I think kids that are uh, feel like they have a space to at least know that they can safely talk about these things without judgment and without um, repercussion or without being given a weight loss intervention, uh, I think is really powerful, right? Because it builds sort of that beginnings of body trust, right? That like, hey, this is my body and I'm learning to sort of be uh, at home with it. If you're noticing, right, your, your, your son, um, is experiencing an eating disorder. I think uh, what I would invite parents to do is to first um, create space for conversation. Like I said, I think there's something really important in um, sharing our story, right? Or knowing that we can share our story, that we can like sort of be vulnerable, but knowing as parents that like, that's a really big ask, right? I, it's not something I'm just like, oh, I think you have an eating disorder, tell me about it. It's, it's like sort of cultivated through uh, through a lot of experiences. Um, I think the other thing that we can do is to, um, you know, ask a lot of questions of 
healthcare providers, right? They say, hey, I think my kid might be experiencing an eating disorder. Can you not bring up weight loss, right? Or or if they do in session to say like, hey, listen, I, that's not gonna be helpful right now, right? Can we not talk about that? But that's a big ask also because it identifies the power dynamic that shows up in healthcare. And it's very uncomfortable for folks to be able to say, hey, uh, to tell a doctor, a nurse practitioner, a nurse, whatever, a dietitian, that what they're doing is actually sort of uh, not helpful, right? And so, and the last thing is thinking about um, what kind of space around outside of the home could be helpful, right? Uh, I think finding a, uh, I'm biased, I think finding a, a weight inclusive dietitian <laughs> is amazingly helpful someone that's going to ask some questions in a, again, kind, compassionate way. I think um, thinking about if re when resources are tough, I, I love what Project Heal is doing. Um, it's a great way for folks to apply for scholarship um, and they work with providers and treatment centers to provide, um, to provide care that is affordable and sometimes even um, totally free for folks depending on need. So I think finding places like Project Heal is amazingly helpful and a great resource for the community. For folks on the other end, donating to Project Heal is becomes extremely important. As a provider, right, saying I'm going to partner with them, I'm going to offer one to two sliding scale or free appointments in my practice, no matter what. Um, it be, That's where the change happens, right, is if, we can think on a really big level about how can we increase access to folks. Thank you so much, okay. Aaron. It's very important to uh, coming here with like solutions of like how to, or like promote, like um, proposing solutions that can actually make a difference um, in gaining access to the treatment. And thank you so much for answering the question. Dr. Reyes Rodriguez, someone asked, how can we raise awareness and challenge the stigma for treatment services within the Latino community? Yeah, I think that uh, that is a great question because I think that in general, we have the stigma about mental health, right? It's like, I'm not crazy, you know, estoy loca, no estoy loco. And, and thinking about seeking treatment is like, a sign of weakness and i think that we need to start normalizing that uh, treatment is a service that is there uh, and we all uh have I, you know i i usually talk about there is not like a person who is completely uh healthy and or completely insane i think that we we have some kind of fluctuation depending on whatever experience we are living uh, so I think that that normalizing that we all have moment, moments where we need to seek treatment or help. Uh, I think that, that 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 would be the key. I think that we have been doing a lot of psychoeducation at the community. I think that that continue talking about uh, receiving treatment. Uh, what is the benefit of getting the treatment? I think that at the community where they feel that, that they can trust that information would be very important. And I always say primary care setting that is the place, the, the first place that they go to receive treatment. So um, having that information very culturally appropriate uh, in primary care setting would be very important to continue raising the, the awareness. Thank you so much, Dr. Okay. Rodriguez. Um, it's very important to address that as well as that is uh, another primary reason why there's like an underutilization of the services within the Latina community. So um, it's per it's important to raise that awareness and that showing that people it's okay to go go ahead and receive treatment when they need to. Whitney, this is two questions, but I feel like they both would um, work perfectly <laughs> with you. Um, so two different people asked, so I'll go ahead and um, ask this question. I mean, the first one, um, how can we address and work to dismantle our own internalized fat phobia? And then the second question is, how can we help more Latinx and BIPOC individuals overcome barriers to become registered dietitians? Oh, I love that. Okay, so the first one was, how can we address our own internalized that yep. phobia? I think that's such a powerful question and I think it has to be ongoing. 
Um, you know, even as somebody that lives in a larger body, I, I struggle with this as well with just the perceptions of social media and what a body should look like, particularly in like BIPOC communities. Um, and it's so, it's so hard. It's so hard. And it's really an ongoing, I think, internal evaluation of what is the root of it. Like, am I focused on European body ideals? Am I comparing myself to somebody that that doesn't even look like me, right? And and I think that is what is so hard. Um, I am biracial and, and grew up in um, Texas. And I remember being young, I didn't even have Barbie dolls that looked like me. I mean, th there was none, right? And thankfully now, I'm, I have a six-year-old who has access to that. Mm -hmm. But you think so often, um, when you can't see a representation, Viola Davis says this, you know, when you can't see a representat representation of yourself, it's hard to manifest those dreams. And I think that can go so perfectly along with the internalized fat phobia as well, because, and, and I'm sure Aaron can speak to this too, in dietetics, mm -hmm. you have a perception of what a dietitian should look like. And when you go into dietetics and you don't fit that mold, it, it is very jarring and it's hard and it's alarming. And if you don't have the support of that, it can make you think, okay, I need to start dieting. I need to start losing weight. I need to look like what a dietitian should look like. Um, and so there is a lot of conflict. I also love Sabrina String's work, uh, mm -hmm. Fearing the Black Body. I think that was very instrumental for me um, as well of looking at that internalized fat phobia and the biases that, that I hold. Um, but I definitely think it's a, all that to say, it's such an ongoing evaluation and really examining what is the root and where is this coming from? Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Anything for the second question? Oh, okay. So how can we help more Latinx and BIPOC individuals overcome barriers to become, oh, registered dietitian? <laughs> that is a profound question. We could probably have another policy briefing on that, to be quite honest. I think it's really hard because, um, one, we know that preceptors don't get paid um, mm -hmm. compared to some other healthcare providers. And so what that does is that creates a significant shortage and faculty and RDs who are who are licensed that can take on students. And so if there's not a preceptors, they're not faculty, it decreases the percentage of RDs coming into the field. And so we need policy change to really address that. Um, I know I know there's federal policy with nursing that's trying to address the, the very same thing as well. Um, it's an unpaid internship. So that is also a barrier. So I would say for, you know, uh, Latinx and BIPOC individuals looking at programs like the VA or looking at, um, mm -hmm. I did a combined program where it was a GA and internship and mm -hmm. they did allow for a stipend. Um, I wouldn't have been able to be a registered dietitian if I didn't have that stipend. And so I think looking at programs like that, uh, but it, it's a significant issue and one mm -hmm. that I really hope that we can have ongoing conversations with, but I would say don't give up. You know, I didn't match my first time um, I got denied when I first did the matching process to be a dietitian, and I think that could be really challenging for some, and um, no one would blame you if you didn't wait a year and reapply, <laughs> you know, but I would say just don't give up um, and continue to reapply and try to find those opportunities if they exist where you are to do a stipend with GA, things like that. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Whitney, and definitely on... Um, difficult because when I was applying to um, the internships, I kind of had to make the decision of do I pay the internship out of pocket like 16K or do I decide to go with the master's program combined internship and go with the loan round? Like, I guess I'll just go with the loan yeah. round. So, and also barriers, just like the studying process and then having to pay for the exam as well. I failed twice and it took it three times. So recently passed. So <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, so, but that was also a barrier of itself, like feeling like giving up and like wanting, like wanting it so bad and like you're seeing it yourself in that position, but it's just like not coming in fruition just yet. But like, like you said, like I uh, advise everyone to just not give up and continue. Um, it's all going to work out in the end. Anything else you would like to add, Aaron? Yeah, I mean, I just want to um, say that, you know, I've, I've no noticed I speak sometimes at undergraduate programs and looking out and seeing a, a diverse crowd and knowing that the internship is such a barrier to entry. Um, I 
would hope that our professional organization also like makes puts puts some uh, influence into changing this um, because you know it is it's like there's a lot of gatekeeping um, that is preventing really qualified people in to to do this job and I think it's very important to think about representation and having folks who um, can support uh, folks and having like going to a dietitian, right? That is where they see themselves in that dietitian is really important instead of just like, you know, a thin white cis woman, which is, you know, the majority of who is who are professionals. Thank you so much for your info. And staying on you, Erin, someone asked, um, growing up as a Latino male in the US, I grew up watching popular TV shows such as The Biggest Loser and seeing people lose 70 plus pounds in two weeks or even one week. Do you think the entertainment presence is still working against efforts, efforts for in awareness? Yes, 100%. Um, and, you know, The Biggest Loser, is such an interesting example. Uh, I think about that show with a lot of sadness and anger. Uh, and I will also be honest, there was a younger me that watched it totally and was intrigued by it. Um, and, but now I, I think, um, that show specifically, um, made abusing fat people our entertainment. <laughs> right we sat there in our in our homes and watched people suffer for our own entertainment and the reality is that show taught people how to have an eating disorder no ifs ands or buts what they taught was this is that to to do this you need to develop an eating disorder and that's really um that's really sad that's really unfortunate. And the impact of that show has been long lasting. And so, yes, I think there's a lot of ways in which media and um, is perpetuating a lot of these narratives. I think about um, the movie The Whale is perpetuating that same narrative. I think influencers who are promoting weight loss um, supplements are perpetuating this idea. I think uh, podcast hosts who have a broad reach across men are perpetuating this um, this narrative around around weight loss. And so I think about the compassion that is needed, right? And sort of like the shift that like, it's really hard to keep these things away from us. They're gonna impact us. And like Whitney was talking about, it's really understandable why we'd have an internalized narrative that our body is not okay because that's all we're taught. So I think sort of understanding that that's the sort of zoomed out picture of what we're living through um, helps us sort of realize, hey, you know, like, how can I, instead of letting the inner critic take over in this, how can I be a little bit kinder to myself and knowing that what I'm trying to do is, is pretty radical. It's pretty amazing, but it's also pretty radical. And, uh, and there aren't a lot of folks doing it alongside with me, which can be hard. Thank you so much, Ryan. And as you were speaking, I started thinking about also one, like the harm of like just losing so much pounds, so many pounds in one week or two. But also what doesn't get discussed is like weight cycling and the harm in weight cycling where you lose so much weight and then you gain so much weight and like the harm of going of yo-yoing, going back and forth and weight causes more harm than actually somebody somebody being fat in the first place. So it's like also another whole topic that we can discuss too. And I wish we had so much more time to just go deep dive in every little thing. Um, Cause I feel like all of it is so much, so important. Um, Dr. Mm -hmm. Ryan Rodriguez, in your presentation, you mentioned the social determinant of food insecurity are initiatives needed to address eating disorders. How can food insecurity lead to an eating disorder? Yeah, well, we have a person who doesn't know when will be the next meal. That 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 is restriction, right? Emotionally have an impact, and 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 lead to some kind of restriction. So, 
Um, the, the first time that I encountered with the food insecurity was working with Latinas, uh, especially crossing the border and mentioning about being like two or three months mm -hmm. without not knowing uh, when was the next meal and how that was triggering the binge eating. Because then when the food was available, that was the moment that they were like trying to eat because they they didn't know when it was the, the next the next meal. So I think that emotionally has an impact uh, and also can continue triggering the, the binging because of the starvation that you have uh, in your body. Uh, so yes, yeah, so I think that, that it is sad that sometimes we are blaming a person because has some kind of disorder when there's some social determinants uh, that are contributing to, to that. Thank you so much, Dr. Reyes Rodriguez. Um, and as we mentioned um, along um, during this session, and you just mentioned right now, binge eating disorder. And binge eating disorder is the most common eating disorder, um, or one of the most common within the Latinx community. Um, and binge eating is not included in the list of diagnoses covered by some insurance company. So Whitney, I know you discussed insurance, you know, previously discussed how health insurance is a, is a barrier to treatment, but can you elaborate further on um, I'm sorry, how can, how can you describe how insurance can be and is a barrier to treatment? Yes, yes. And Erin had mentioned earlier Project Heal, and I love this organization and um, kind of echoing what Erin said, Project Heal does a phenomenal job of helping with scholarships, except, um, access to treatment, but they also have an insurance navigator. Um, but I do want to highlight, they recently did, I think it was like University of Wyoming and Louisville. Um, I might not be totally accurate on the universities that they partnered with, but they looked at barriers to treatment to access kind of across the U.S. And the number one barrier to access treatment was finances. And so when we think about insurance in this country, I think the last report I saw, there were somewhere between 28 and 30 million people who were uninsured the majority of those who are working. And so one of the things with insurance, particularly when we're talking about eating disorders, it's both mental health and medical. And so even if somebody has access to insurance, that doesn't mean that they have the mental health coverage to address eating disorders. And Dr. Reyes Rodriguez mentioned this as well. It's a treatment approach, right? So I might have coverage to go see my PCP um, who does some initial screening and says, hey, this is, we, we you know, we got to start finding some other providers to help you. Um, so then you still need a dietitian, you need a therapist, and you need a psychiatric provider. And so, you know, when you think about other modalities of mental illness, you don't necessarily have this treatment approach that you need. And we need a treatment approach to address eating disorders. It needs to be family oriented, patient oriented, and we've, we've got to have a comprehensive, hopefully weight inclusive team that Aaron mentioned. But that's assuming somebody can afford that. And mm -hmm. so, you know, again, we, we have got to address the policy when it comes to insurance. Why insurance going back to the BMI? Um, I cannot tell you how many people that really needed a higher level of care wanted to go to a higher level of care, but could not because of their BMI. And so we need to address why can insurance dictate based again on a BMI, the length of stay for somebody insurance wise, why are we not being more preventative for mental health access? And then you have to look at, quite honestly, not every state has a higher level of care. So if you have a specific state plan, but you don't have a higher level of care residential facility in your state, your insurance is not gonna pay for you to go to out of state. And so it's it's just, it's multidimensional, but I, I really hope that we can create some policy and hold insurance companies, quite frankly, accountable for being able to delay access to care and deny access to care, um, because we know that there's, su there's such a high mortality rate with eating disorders. Yeah, just give you universal health care and everything, you know, just yeah. dump everything in there. <laughs> Please. Uh, thank you so much, Whitney. Um, uh, any other panelists can answer this question. We just had an incoming question on how have our nutrition standards been influenced by corporate lobbying, which pri um, prioritizes profit over people's health? That's a deep question. <laughs> Aaron, do you want to? That's not going to keep throwing it at you, but I'm just trying to circulate the conversation. <laughs> 
Oh, Aaron, um, we don't hear you. It helps if I unmute myself uh, <laughs> on that little thing there. Um, you know, the, the unfortunate thing, but the reality is that um, food is political and bodies are political. And it's about, you know, I think about that term and I think about who has power and who has not have power in this system. And I think the, you know, thinking very broadly, right, as we think about policy and we think about um, supporting, you know, a vast number of people, um, unfortunately, profit does get into it, right? People think about, uh, you know, how am I going to, uh, you know, make sure my industry, right, is uh, being represented. And um, Marion Nessel writes a great book about food politics uh, that examines this uh, way better than I could explain. But I think it's important to sort of, again, be curious about, you know, um, why does my plate look like my plate? You know, it, it's, uh, there's, there's a political answer to that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, part of what, what I love about being a dietitian, right, is knowing the sort of big stuff, but zooming in and saying like, you know what, my, my plate isn't going to look like everyone's plate. They're going to look different. And um, I need to be thoughtful in how I provide care to acknowledge that. And, but, you know, I think the reality is that our system is very profit driven. It is political. Um, and the more we accept that and understand that, I think the more we can think about the inequalities that result from that, um, from that system. Thank you so much, Erin. I feel like um, also like as like a, somebody like studied like dietetics, nutrition, like you learn one thing in the university, especially depending on which university you went to, and which nutrition program. And then you have to take the initiative and self-educating on like everything else um, that requires you to be the best overall uh, overall healthcare provider. Like I feel like that's very important. And that question, you know, really gets your wheels turning and thinking about like, yeah, there, there's a lot of problems going on and how we um, put in the forefront of like what's healthy and what's not or what is healthy and what's not. Um, and it's just, it's just wild. <laughs> Um, Dr. Reyes Rodriguez, I'll give you the last question. Um, during your first research study on eating disorders in the Latinx community, what was the most surprising finding you discovered? So the first study that I conducted was in Puerto Rico. And, and as being part of U.S., I was amazed that we didn't have any data about eating disorder in our population. So I decided to do like a prevalence study across the University of Puerto Rico in all of the campuses around the, the island. And uh, we found a pretty similar prevalence than in US. So I think that, that and, and also what is was surprising was having more prevalence in males purging behavior and binge eating behavior. So that was the time that I realized, oh my God, th there is something going on here that we, you know, we don't know. Um, and, and I think that, again, it's, if we don't ask, we don't know. And I think that uh, all of the misconception that this is only a white female issue. Um, and, and because of that, we have been assess the eating disorder in diverse population. I think that this is part of the, the, the intention is, is continue adding more diversity, understanding better what is going on uh, with diverse population and having treatments that are more consistent with, with all of the differences that, that, that we have in our um, population. Thank you so much, Dr. Reyes Rodriguez, and thank you for all the work that you do. Again, thinking about how you're the one who created the two, only two culturally competent material out there is, <laughs> is wild. And having the opportunity to discuss with you and all of you has been great. Um, and I'm pretty sure the audience enjoyed the discussion as well. 
Um, thank you all for all your questions and thank you, Dr. Reyes Rodriguez, Whitney and Aaron for sharing your wisdom and knowledge. I really am super grateful that you all joined me today. I admire all the work that you do for the community. As we wrap up the session, I would love it if you um, were to share your final thoughts with the audience and if you can give them another takeaway, um, a final takeaway on one thing from today's panel, what would that be? Whitney, go first. <laughs> um, yeah, I would say, um, you know, like Aaron said, food is political, healthcare is political. Um, so get involved. You know, we we need more policy change, um, for t you know, across the span of mental health and, and access um, and specifically for eating disorders. Um, we, we desperately need it. And so I hope that this panel was an encouragement, but I also hope that it opened your eyes to the issues that we need to continue to address. Um, and yeah, I'm I'm. So excited again and just humbled that you even asked me to be on this amazing panel with my colleagues and um, yeah, looking forward to continuing to work with people and others so we can really address systemic and policy change for better treatment access. Thank you so much, Whitney. Dr. Reyes Rodriguez, would you like to go next? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for this amazing uh, job organizing this panel. I think that uh, continue having um, um, Latinas and Latinos uh, trying to continue raising the awareness and organizing this kind of discussion is, is part of the, the, the process. So uh, thank you. Thank you for, for doing that. And, and I think that I hope that we can see some changes in a more uh, upper level. <laughs> thank you so much, Dr. Reyes Rodriguez. And Aaron? Yeah, um, just to echo what, what everyone said is, um, things like this make me really hopeful. Uh, if you would have told me five years ago, I'd be on uh, a panel talking about eating disorders uh, amongst men and underserved communities as a policy briefing, I would have told you that you're bonkers. Um, and so the fact that we're actually having these conversations um, gives me a lot of hope because someone's listening right now and they're gonna walk away thinking about things a little bit differently and like Whitney said, I think the more people who get involved, the better, the, 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 the more change comes about. And so my invitation to folks is to continue to question um, what they think around eating disorders, that you can't tell who has an eating disorder based on the color of their skin, the size of their body, their gender, where they live. They are um, really horrific things that people struggle with they are really, they take it so much from people's lives and the more compassion and understanding we have helps people um, get a lot of healing that they deserve. So thank you for inviting me and having me a part of this panel. Thank you so much, Aaron. I would just like to take this time again to thank you all, the, thank you the panelists for their time and expertise. I would also like to thank you for the audience for listening in on a topic that is very important to us. Disorder eating and eating disorders are very serious and affect many. So knowing the facts is very important. Addressing the barriers is key to future planning and policy making that increases research, diagnosis, and treatment, including culturally competent treatment. If you or someone you know is experiencing signs and symptoms of eating disorders or disorder eating, please visit projectheal.org for more information regarding services and support. This session has now ended. Please stay tuned for the rest of the CHCI Capitol Hill policy briefing series, including the session at 4 p.m. today on the dual challenges of speed and environmental justice. Thank you so much and have a great rest of your day.